previously on Retro Hack Shack. So come along this journey with me as I take a look at this full tower PC, and that is a Varda battery, and it is definitely leaking and growing things. Oh, so dusty. Hey, look at that. Awesome. Speedstar Plus. Wow, I didn't think that would work. I want to come back and fix the floppy drive, put in a battery so I don't have to keep putting in uh, the settings into the CMOS every time I turn off the PC. And most importantly, I want to get some MIDI sound out of this board. Well, there's a lot to do today in a short amount of time in which to do it. I mean by in video terms. Could spend a lot of time talking about this stuff, but I'm trying to keep this one under an hour. So uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to install a new CMOS battery because every time I go in uh, after turning the computer off for a little while and go back in to use it, I have to put those settings back in CMOS, the hard drive settings, the floppy uh, drive settings, and then uh, write those to CMOS. And then I can go ahead and use the computer for a while until I turn it off again. Um, so there's two ways to do that. I showed in one of my previous videos where I repaired a um, an XT clone. I'll link that one up above if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, when I repaired that, I had to do that to one of the cards that had a real-time clock. And I used one of these CR2032 uh, batteries. You can get these uh, pretty cheaply almost anywhere. They come, I get them by the five pack like this, and then I usually get five five packs, so 25 batteries or something at a time, because I go through a lot of them. They are three volt lithium batteries and they are not rechargeable. If you remember from that video, I had to put a diode in to make sure that these weren't getting charged by the charging circuit that was on that card. Same thing with this computer here. I don't want, if I used a CR2032, I wouldn't want that to get charged uh, by the by the charging circuit as the computer expects there to be a rechargeable battery there. So I could use a diode to block that charging um, current from coming through. However, there's another solution to this, and this is a similar battery, but it's called an LR2032 or an LIR2032. Now this is also a lithium battery, but it is rechargeable. Um, these CR2032s are only three volts, which is a little bit less than the 3.6 volt battery that was in there originally, uh, this LIR2032 is a 3.6 volt battery. So it seems to actually uh, match up pretty well. The danger is, is with these lithium batteries is you can overcharge them. And so anything over about 4.2 volts uh, could spell disaster for you in terms of these batteries, these little batteries exploding. You certainly don't want that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the current, the, or the uh, voltage rather, that's actually present uh, where the battery is, where those terminals are, and see if it's less than 4.2 volts. If it's somewhere around 4 volts, that would be perfect. Maybe I can even drop that a little bit with a dropping resistor. Um, but anytime you get north of 4 volts, using these uh, lithium rechargeables is probably going to be a bad idea and not worth the amount of time saved uh, just by skipping that step of putting in the diode. Let's get these cards out of here, and I'm going to go in with my meter and see what the voltage actually is on the board while it's running. All right, so let's get down in here and see while the computer's running what this charging voltage is. Okay, so yeah, it's 4.8, uh, which is too high for one of these lithium batteries, the, the uh, rechargeable LIR2032s. So we're going to have to go with the diode route and use the CR2032, uh, and hopefully that 3 volts will be enough to keep the uh, uh, CMOS information stored. Um, if not, I'll have to come up with another option. Okay, so I've got my battery holder and my diode that I'm going to use. The battery holder, uh, if there was enough, if I didn't have to worry about the diode, I could just put this right in the holes. It lines up exactly with the existing holes, which is nice. A lot of these motherboards do line up with the standard uh, width of the pins on these battery holders. However, uh, we need to put the diode in. So uh, let's put the diode in first and then solder this one end, the positive end here, 
the top of the diode and the other one will go right in the uh, uh, on that pad there, the negative side. Um, but before I do that, I need to clean off the rest of this uh, residue. There's still some, I clipped this off, so there's still some metal in there. And so I want to go ahead and see if I can get that out. I'm gonna go ahead and use some flux. Uh, this is just some liquid soldering flux and put a little bit of that on there. And then I'm gonna use this soldering braid and see if I can get that out. The, uh, uh, by the way, if you're using soldering braid, this NTE I find to be a pretty good brand. It's fairly inexpensive. It does have flux built into the braid and uh, that helps tremendously when you're using this desoldering braid or, or de uh, desoldering wick, whichever way you like to call it. So yeah, if you're looking to get some of this, make sure you get the one with, most of them do have, uh, the built-in uh, uh, flux there. So, um, but I was using one that did not have the built-in flux and I was wondering why I couldn't uh, get very good results. Okay, now to put the negative side of the diode into the positive connection here. That may seem counterintuitive, but we want the battery to discharge into the board when it's not on. We wanna block the battery from getting charged uh, by the charging circuit. So this diode will accomplish that. So I redid this diode. I don't know if you can see it, but I bent it down because the the battery was too far crooked in one direction. It wasn't really sitting nicely and there was no way I was gonna get the battery out once I got it in there. So um, I ended up bending the uh, diode over. Unfortunately, it looks like it's gonna be in the way of this screw perhaps, but that's okay. One screw is enough to hold this board in. If I can get another screw in there, great. If not, that's fine. But anyway, that's the way it works. If I, if I did it, if I had the energy and I wanted to do it over, I could go back and rejigger it so it was out of the way of the screw hole, but I probably don't care. So uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna work that way. Okay, I've got everything put back together. Uh, so hopefully this works because I really don't wanna have to go through and take all those cards out again. <laughs> so let's turn it on and see what happens. No sparks, no shorts. Okay, normal that we would have to set this up because we just put the battery in. All right, well, it's been a little over an hour, so let's see if the settings are still saved in the BIOS. And yes, they are, because it didn't even go to BIOS. Uh, it just went right through. So I would say that the battery is working. Yay, no more entering all these settings every time I go to do something on this thing. I should probably should have done that the very first thing. Now, one of the things that I completely forgot to test, and I probably should have tested it on the first episode, was the five and a quarter inch floppy drive. I did test the three and a half inch floppy drive and found out that that drive is bad, but I did not test the five and a quarter inch floppy drive. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and clean this drive first. We'll put a disc in and see if that works. And to do that, I'm going to use this new in the box, new old stock. I don't know what this is. Hasn't never been opened before. It's a Memorex uh, computer cleaning system. So this says it's the complete PC cleaning system for disk drives, printers, monitors, and keyboards all in one box. So the nice thing about this is it includes a five and a quarter and a three and a half inch cleaning disk and some static free wipes and, and some things like that. So let's open this thing up and we'll see if it's any good after however many years. Yeah, it says right down here, this was made in 1990. So yeah, after 30 years, let's see if this still will clean a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Here it is, all boxed up nicely. Does it smell like uh, 80s? Let's see. No, it smells like old garage. <laughs> I always wonder what LGR is smelling when he smells stuff. No, this smells like old garage. Come on, dude. Ooh, yep, that's still good. <laughs> so, like I said, just put a little bit on one side, put a little on the other side. Stick it in and activate the drive somehow. So I'll do that by doing B colon. 
This is a uh, uh, double-sided drive, so it has two heads. So this should be really clean now. I don't have to worry about covering up one side. Yeah, so interestingly enough, this cleaning kit for the drives actually came out before the tower. Okay, and to test this, let's just play a little Marble Madness, maybe. This was a, a reproduction label that I did for Marble Madness. So let's give this a try. Yeah, so I don't know if you could hear that, but it's making some awfully strange sounds. So this drive is a 1.2 megabyte drive, and it can't read this disk which was formatted as a 360K drive, which I thought you could read, um, but I didn't think that you could go backwards, like format a 360K disk here and then take that and put it in a uh, an older drive and read that. Uh, the reason is twofold. One is that the tracks are, are narrower in these... Um, uh, newer drives. So the 1.2 megabyte drives has 80 sectors or something like that. Anyway, the tracks are narrower and uh, the tracks on the older older ones are like, I don't know if they're double, but they're a lot wider. So the track width on the disk is different. Also, the speed is different. So I think this is like a 360K drive and, and the, or sorry, yeah, 360 RPM drive. And I think this is... Um, uh, maybe 250 or something, the old 360K drives that would have been like in an IBM XT. I think they're like 250 RPMs or something, and this is 360. Anyway, um, so the speed is different. The track width is different. It can't read this disk, but it did format this disk okay after some funkiness with the mechanism. So I'm going to test this out a little bit further. I just checked these disks, and they're not high density. They're double density, double sided. And I went and I broke out, uh, sorry, I couldn't do an unboxing, but I went and broke out a uh, fresh package off the shelf of these Maxell high density disks, which is what you need for 1.2 megabyte drives. And now it appears that the drive is working. So I'm gonna go back to DOS now and we'll take a look and see if I can format this from the command line. I don't know if I miss the good old days or not anymore. Floppy test. Let's go. Passed. Woohoo. All right. <laughs> so finally, 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 uh, we got this drive sorted out. That's awesome. Everything passed, no problems. By the way, as I go through this video, you'll notice I'm wearing a, a number of different sweatshirts and shirts and things. It is unseasonably cold uh, this time of year in California. So I'm out in the garage trying to build this new studio. It's not heated yet. I don't even know if I'll make it heated because 95% of the time I don't need it to be heated. But uh, yeah, it's really cold. So I grew up on the East Coast and uh, we had cold winters there. You know, I, there was one January where it didn't get above zero degrees Fahrenheit for the whole month of January. But here in, now I'm in California and it's like 40 degrees, which makes for a pretty cold garage. Um, so yeah, you'll see me change <laughs> different flannel shirts and stuff. It's because it's really cold in the garage right now. Well, it's time for another Penny Cam, and Penny just turned one years old, but she still has a lot of energy. For example, why would you go around the couch when you can just go over the couch? Good girl. Good girl. Are you here? Good girl, Penny. Okay, the other thing I wanted to test, which I brought up in the last video, is this card that the CD-ROM plugs into. It has an IDE controller on it, which is great, but it also has those two audio jacks in the back, or RCA jacks. I assume they're audio jacks. So I just wanted to plug those in and see if we get any audio out um, of those jacks in the back. So uh, I've plugged in a cable here, and I'm gonna plug this into the speakers. Let's turn this on and see if we get any audio. Hey, 
And for this test, I'm gonna be just putting in a music CD. This is the first one I could lay my hands on. It's the original Cornell Syncopators. And the reason I'm playing this one, well, the reason I have this one is because my son is in this. When he was in school, when he was in college, he's right there playing the good old saxophone. So, hi, Steven. Okay, now I shouldn't need any, any programs running for this because it should just be playing CD audio. I remember when CDs first came out, this was a huge deal. Like, I don't need to buy a CD player. I can just play the audio on my computer and hook it up to some speakers. It's so cool. So anyway, that's in there now. Uh, this has a play button on it. So let's just hit play. Let's see what happens. Okay, it should be playing. I'm not hearing anything. Hmm. Oh, you know what? I bet I have to change the audio. The audio plug in the back of the CD-ROM is going to the Sound Blaster. Let me change that over to this card and see if we get audio out. Okay, so I found four pins on that other little card um, that was just a pin header. It wasn't like the nice, had the nice shroud on it that the thing, the audio cable plugged into, but it looked like the same thing. So let's see if this works. So I have no idea whether this will get contact, content matched or not. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like old timey jazz music and it sounds great. So this definitely works and that card definitely works for audio output. Now for the part you've all been waiting for, it's time to test out some DOS games. And it's time to test out the MIDI uh, device that we created to see what that sounds like. But in order to do that, there is a problem here. And that is, if you remember loading DOS games back in the day, a lot of times you didn't have enough conventional memory or expanded memory to be able to run these games. For example, I've preloaded all these games on the system because you guys don't really need to see me loading software, but I've loaded these games on the system already. If I try to run, for example, this game, Lands of Lore, uh, without doing anything different by just booting up and going to the C drive and running it, here's what happens. We have insufficient conventional memory by such and such bytes, it needs this much. So what's happening here is that DOS and some other things are running and they're taking up some of this 640K worth of space um, that is built into the uh, to, to DOS. That's what the 640K was kind of the limit of DOS at the time. And then there was memory expanders that would push stuff up into uh, upper memory. Um, but in order to launch like a regular DOS game, you need at least a little bit of a uh, certain amount of space available uh, by these games to launch to launch them in conventional memory. So right now I haven't done any uh, moving of stuff around. I haven't used any drivers to load DOS and some other things into upper memory. Those are all loaded in conventional memory. So what I did was I went out to Phil's computer lab and I found um, he has a bunch of utilities there. I certainly highly recommend going to Phil's computer lab and looking at what he has. One of the things he has is an MS-DOS startup disk. Um, now, this is actually a startup utility. Normally, this program is supposed to run on a hard drive. So you load his utility. When you install it, it loads all of the necessary files to your hard drive so that when you boot up without a disk even, um, you'll be able to uh, free up that uh, conventional memory for these games to run. However, I didn't want to load it on my hard drive in this system for a number of reasons. One is that it still has that quantum uh, tool that uh, um, allows you to run a bigger hard drive than you would normally be able to run. And I don't know how it would interact with that. So what I did was I went out and got um, his utility and converted all of the config sys and autoexec.bat files to load everything from a floppy disk instead. Let me show you what this looks like real quick. Now, in order to get the OnTrack software here to uh, both see the C drive and be able to boot off the A drive, you have to hit spacebar when this comes up. Then you can put in your disk, hit spacebar again, and it will enable you to see the C drive and boot from the A drive at the same time. So it's just something you gotta watch out for. All right, so here's what you get when you boot up this disk. Um, you get all of these choices. It'll automatically default to number one if you don't do anything. Um, but there's nine different choices here. And they range from having expanded memory with mouse and CD support 
uh, to extended memory, and then all the way down to conventional memory only. And the reason there's so many choices is because uh, different games, um, different programs even, would require different combinations of memory and device support in order to run. And Phil goes through this on his blog where he talks about this program. And different games require different combinations of either ex expanded memory, extended memory, and conventional memory in order to run. Um, so if you remember this back in the day, uh, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of you do. You, we all had various boot floppies that we would create with high mem, uh, EMM386, different combinations of load high and uh, UMB and all of these settings that would go into our config sys and auto exec bat files in order to free up as much space as possible and get the right combination so that you could run your game. So this brought back a lot of memories just going through this, but I would highly recommend this startup program. Uh, definitely, you know, if you just have a DOS gaming machine, this would be great to load on your C drive so that when you boot it up, you get this every time and things will just be a lot easier to run. Otherwise, feel free to create the floppy disk. Maybe Phil has a floppy disk. I don't know. I didn't see one. So I just created one myself using his tool. So now if we go back to the C drive, pull up lands of lore and run it, we won't get that error message again that said you're out of conventional memory. We still get this same little check here, but sound card. Virgin on. Interactive Entertainment presents the Westwood Studios production of Lands of Lore, The Throne of Chaos. There, now we're getting voice, we're getting music. This, this brings back so much memory. This is one of my favorite games from this time period. I played the heck out of this game. And I've played it multiple times since, just for the nostalgia. I thought this opening sequence was genius. The horse running, there's a sequence up here where the bridge goes up and down. I mean, really, really cool game from my perspective. If you haven't played it, you ought to give it a try. Here he goes across the bridge. Listen to this. Bridge opens. Listen to the, how the footsteps change as he goes across. Oh, I just thought, I was like, what? Who came up with that? Because games before this didn't take that attention to detail like this did. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. I have need of a champion. Who among you will volunteer to serve me in this matter? So you may recognize that voice. That is, of course, the voice of Sir Patrick Stewart. Um, they re-released this game on CD. It originally came on, I think, 10 or 11 floppy disks, believe it or not that you could load onto the system. That's the version that I had, well, but... have you decided? Yeah, yeah, hang on a second. Um, but in this case, um, what they did was they re-released it the next year on CD, and they uh, got Patrick Stewart, who was, of course, super popular at this point because he was in Star Trek The Next Generation, and uh, they actually... Have you decided? Hang on, dude. Um, they actually got him to uh, to voice the character of Sir Richard, so or King Richard, whatever that guy's name is. So pretty cool. If you go through this, if you want to hear his voice as the king here, you definitely need to pick up the CD version. Well, have you decided? Yes, I will decide. Now, you might be wondering how I was able to transfer some of the files over to this computer. Well, given that this computer did have an Ethernet uh, card in it, and I wanted to test that out and make sure it worked, I went ahead and connected it to my existing network and transferred files over it that way. But it's not as easy as it sounds. Number one, I'm in the garage and I don't have a cable long enough to go from the back of this computer over to my network. So I needed to communicate wirelessly. Now I did try some of my old access points to see if I could use those kind of as a wireless bridge, but the ones that I had didn't have that exact functionality. They could be used as a repeater to repeat a Wi-Fi signal, but of course, with this vintage of computer, that doesn't help me at all. So what I ended up doing was buying this. It's an IO gear, Ethernet to Wi-Fi universal adapter, universal wireless adapter is what it's called. Um, I will put a link to this down below, an affiliate link. Great way to support the channel if you wanna buy something like this is by clicking those links and purchasing something. That'll uh, give me a few cents on every purchase. Now, the way this works is you hook it up to an existing laptop or computer over the Ethernet, connect to it through a special IP address, and then configure it to attach to your Wi-Fi. Once you've done that, you disconnect it, move it over to the device that you are wanting to connect to your Wi-Fi, 
It doesn't have to be necessarily vintage computers. It also works for old game consoles, TiVo boxes, things like that. Um, you just hook it up to this device powered up and it will then connect to your Wi-Fi. Um, the nice thing about it, as I said, is this device will not interfere in the network configuration. It doesn't use network address translation or anything like that. It simply acts as a gateway, essentially. Uh, this computer, it gets a um, address on my local network, which it pulls from my DHCP server so that this computer is now recognized as a client on the network uh, with no strings attached. Really nice little device, and I will be using this a lot in the future for other devices of this vintage. Now that's part one, getting the device on the network. Part two is actually enabling uh, a service so that you can transfer files back and forth. You could do this in DOS with an FTP server. I found it much easier just to go ahead and use Windows 95 since that's what's installed. So I have a Samba server running at my house. I went ahead and enabled the old protocols on that Samba server, which are inherently insecure. So be aware of what you're doing. Uh, I plan to enable those and then disable those again once I'm done with this project. But for now, all of those settings on my Samba server are enabled. And then I found that by logging into the Windows network, putting in a username and password, I could then attach to those uh, Samba shares and transfer files. And it worked flawlessly once I got it set up. It did take me a few hours of work to get everything put together the right way, but now that I have that done, it'll be really easy to reproduce that next time. I will also share a link to the settings I used for my Samba server down below in the comments uh, to a website. Uh, which talks about using a Raspberry Pi to set up a separate Samba server and keep that whole network segmented, so to speak, so that you don't have to worry about the security implications. Uh, but I'll put that down below. I just went through and took the settings for the Samba server out of that site, put them on my Samba server temporarily, and that got me up and running. So now it's time to move on to the MIDI board. And as I open up my boards from PCB Way here, we'll get started putting this thing together. If you want to order your own PCBs like this, or something like the RGB to HDMI module I sell on my website, look no further than PCB Way. You can get prototype PCBs as low as $5, and they do assembly, 3D printing, CNC milling, pretty much everything you need to build your projects. And until the end of December, you can get special coupons with big discounts during their Christmas festival. So check out PCB Way for low cost PCBs and way more vintage computer fun. And I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. There aren't too many components for this little board that goes on top of the Raspberry Pi. So while I'm putting this together, let me tell you what it is. So my journey into this project started as it usually does with a Google search to see if I could run MIDI on a Raspberry Pi. And sure enough, I came upon this project, MT32-Pi. Now what this project does is it uses a Raspberry Pi 3 or above. If you're not familiar, Raspberry Pi is a single board computer, fairly popular at this point for maker projects. In fact, I even wrote a book on it called Linux for Makers. You can look that one up on Amazon or uh, wherever you purchase your books. Anyway, uh, this project uh, uses the Raspberry Pi to emulate a Roland MT32 device uh, based on Munt, which is a uh, emulator for the MT32. Um, and it does a bunch of other things as well. It allows you to add your own sound fonts if you want to expand your synthesizer with General MIDI, Roland GS, or Yamaha XG support. Um, and it also has some things that allows it to be integrated with uh, Mr. FPGA. I know that's a popular project right now. Um, you can use various Raspberry Pis, although you have to be careful which ones you use. It especially works with the Raspberry Pi, mod uh, Pi 3 Model A, B, or B+, the Raspberry Pi 4, and uh, even the new Raspberry Pi 20W will work with it, although other platforms uh, are a bit buggy, so I would recommend against that. Now, the other part of the project is something that sits on top of the Pi called a hat. In this case, I'm using a project called Clumsy MIDI. There are several out there uh, which allow you, which give you a physical interface to the Raspberry Pi so that you can plug in your uh, MIDI connections, etc., and a DAC to output the sound. So you can truly use this just like you would a Roland MT32. 
And uh, this project is the one that I'm building today. This one features MIDI in, MIDI out, a DAC, as I mentioned before, and even a little display that sits on top of the project, which allows you to get some interaction with what's going on, what sounds, what instruments are playing, etc., etc. So this is the board I'm going to be building today. On the GitHub page, there's also instructions for configuring the software that you'll need for using this particular board. Like I said, there's several of these out there and uh, you can pick one and build a different one if you want, but I chose this one. Uh, one important thing to note is that this DAC board, that's the purple board that you'll see on the project, has some specific jumpers here that need to be soldered together. In my case, these were not soldered at all, so I had to go in and solder these according to this picture, so watch out for that one. Now, I ordered five boards uh, to solder, and I've got four of them left, so I'll be throwing them up on my shop at retrohackshack.com shop. If you wanna just grab a PCB from me, one of my extra ones, and uh, source your own components and build this, highly recommend that you do that, but there's only four available at the time of this recording. Uh, so first come, first served. Okay, so it's time to hook up this Raspberry Pi MIDI device to the computer and see if it emulates an MT, Roland MT32 or not. Um, I've got one of these cables. Uh, these would be handy to pick up if you don't have one, but you want to do something like this. It's one of those MIDI breakout cables. I think these came with the Sound Blaster, or maybe you had to buy them separately. This looks fairly generic, but anyway, plugs into the MIDI port on the back of the Sound Blaster card, and then you get uh, a couple of MIDI, MIDI in and MIDI out connections. So I'm going to plug this in. Uh, this will go to the... Um, uh, Raspberry Pi MIDI device that we made, and then typically the output of that would go back into the input of the sound card. But what I'm going to do just to test this out is plug the output directly into the speakers and play a MIDI file just to see if it'll actually work and play something. So let me get this hooked up. Okay, time to power this up and see what happens. I'm going to be watching the display here to see if I get any readings, or I'm assuming it has some sort of startup uh, display there, so let's see what happens. Okay, looks like the power's on. Ooh! MT32 Pi. Uh, not only do I get a MT32 Pi, but then it quickly switches to the version of ROM that I'm using, because you have to load ROM files for your uh, uh, Roland MT. 32 in here, and then it has like, I don't know, different channels, volume, what does it say, 80? It's hard to see from here. Okay, and I'm using a DOS player here called Play Mid. Um, most of the sites recommended this one, so I'm going to be using that to play the MIDI. And then um, this is a MIDI file that I downloaded from King's Quest V. It should be the introduction. So, fingers crossed, let's play it. Okay, it says press any key to quit. Tells me the file name. Um, nothing's changed on the, oh, wait a second. It says Quest Studios, but I don't hear any sound. Is that normal? Does it take a while to load a MIDI file? You have to wait a while? Oh. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. What? Oh, that's awesome. Holy crap. Oh man, that sounds really, really cool. And it has like a mixer on the display. Let me see if I can get a, a close up of that to show you. Okay, what I'm going to do now is go through the openings for each of the three games and we'll compare the difference between the, the built-in sound coming out just out of the Sound Blaster and what comes out of the emulated Roland MT32 here on this Raspberry Pi device. 
So uh, what I'll do, I'm not going to show this, but what I'm going to do is before I play um, each one, I'm going to have to go in and configure it through these screens. I'm sure you remember these uh, from back in the day where you have to configure your music card output and so forth. For this one, I'm going to pick Sound Blaster Pro. Then I'm going to go back and do it again and select MT32. So I will be um, doing this behind the scenes. But for now, let's go ahead and kick it off with the Sound Blaster only version of Lands of Lore. Virgin Interactive Entertainment presents the Westwood Studios production of Lands of Lore, The Throne of Chaos. Virgin Interactive Entertainment presents the Westwood Studios production of Lands of Lore, The Throne of Chaos. Okay, for this next game I want to test out, it's uh, something that's actually been re-released very recently, and that is Dune. The movie just came out, uh, as I'm recording this, a few months ago. I think it was November, October, November 2021, something like that. And uh, it was a great movie. I went to see it with my family, a great uh, uh, reimagining of the Dune story, if you ever read the books or saw the movie in the 80s. Anyway, I thought with that in mind, I would take a look at Dune and see what the built-in sound looks like over the Sound Blaster and then compare that with the sound over the Raspberry Pi MT32 Pi. Did I say that right? MT32 Pi. Anyway, over the Raspberry Pi project I built.
Okay, finally a game that's near and dear to my heart. This game is Civilization. Uh, the very first Civilization that came out came out while I was in college. And I remember seeing a buddy of mine play this and thinking, wow, what is that game? I've got to get a copy. So he made me a copy of his discs. And despite what people were saying at the time about copying floppy disks, I thought you knew better. Don't copy that floppy. That actually sold me on the game, and I've bought every single game and I think every expansion pack that's come out ever since. So Sid Meier and company have got their money out of me, even though they didn't get it for that very first game. And I still have my discs right here. Uh, these are the discs, the copy of the discs that I made while I was in school, played the heck out of these, wasted a lot of time. But uh, yeah, still got the discs, and that what's what is what we're going to check out right now. First the Sound Blaster, and then of course the MT-32. Well, all I can say is I am blown away by the performance of Raspberry Pi plus this clumsy MIDI device plus the uh, MT32 Pi software running on it. I mean, it really does a great job. Now, granted, I don't own a Roland MT32, but uh, inspired by this, I'm going to be playing as many DOS games as I can with that option enabled because the sound really blew me away. Not only that, it may be interesting actually to compare the performance of this device with an actual Roland MT32, if I'm ever lucky enough to find one. So maybe if that's an episode you're interested in, leave a comment down below and let me know. As far as this PC is concerned, it is really running great. It's running all these DOS games without a hiccup. Of course, there's driver issues and things like that going back and forth, trying to get files transferred. But hopefully you found some of the information in here useful. I know I had a great time restoring this uh, tower uh, PC, the full tower PC. Uh, it needs just a little bit of spot cleaning. 
no reason to feature that really on the episode. Just some Windex will do a good job with it. And I look forward to using this in future episodes as I test out some more you know, late 80s, early 90s uh, DOS type stuff. So remember, this is December. You can look for more videos by using the hashtags on the screen. Uh, if you like what you saw today, give it a like, give it a thumbs up, uh, subscribe to the channel, or become a patron. Uh, and I just want to say thank you. It's uh, the end of the year. It's the holiday season. Thank you to everyone who has supported the channel over the year. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is one of the best communities I've ever been involved with. The retro community is alive and well. And I think it just stems from all of us being so nostalgic for our childhoods, especially around the holiday season for many of us uh, growing up with these types of machines, playing games, um, you know, it's just a great community. So thank you, uh, all of you who have uh, watched my videos and uh, done all that stuff. I really appreciate it. And thank you, too, for all the encouraging words, all the great comments you've left. I do try to read everyone. So anyway, thank you very much. Have a happy holiday. We'll see you next time. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash retrohackshack and sign up. End of line.